Welcome everybody to my talk about Gigabit, Gigabit Ethernet Receiver with Large Field of View. Um, I would also like to acknowledge my co-authors, Kitama McConnon, who is in the room, and now, nowadays, by the way, is with Tino, right? Frans Huiskens, Kwan uh, Van, Sijong Zhao, and Edward Tanjonga. Okay, this talk will be about how to enlarge the field of view for high-speed optical wireless communication receivers. First, I would like to introduce you to our system concept, the so-called BROWSE concept, about beam steering, uh, optical wireless communication, uh, the requirements that concept brings for the receiver side, then continue with this uh, focus of the paper, which is about uh, constructing a matrix, 2D matrix of photodiodes, in order to get uh, high bandwidth um, receiving capacity with large aperture. So introduce you to the characteristics of this solution, and also address the biasing uh, issues which you may uh, suspect uh, go with it. Then how to, uh, such a matrix will help in coupling optical beam to the matrix, to the photodiode matrix, uh, by means of ray tracing analysis and then analysis of the field of view versus the coupling efficiency of the beam to the photodiode. And then conclude with some reports on the results we made with this, an optical wireless communication receiver performance, and how we did gigabit ethernet live video streaming with it, and some final remarks about this technology. So first of all, let me introduce you the concept of our BROWSE system. BROWSE stands for Broadband Reconfigurable Optical Wireless System with High Energy Efficiency. Um, it has been a European Research Council project, advanced grant project. It relies on using very narrow pencil beams. Do I have a pointer here somewhere? Not really. Okay, so it talks about uh, beams which are represented by these colored lines over here, narrow beams which address individual devices of the users, uh, meaning that each user only gets one beam, and the beam as such then functions as a kind of virtual fiber. It has actually, it can show theoretically even a higher capacity than a fiber has, but it addresses only a single user, that means the capacity is not shared with other ones. It can offer you a high capacity, uh, long reach as well, when you really um, collimate the beam and it offers also high level of privacy because your neighbors will not get that beam. We use wavelengths beyond 14 nanometer because that's eye safe, as you've seen from the previous talks, which allows beam powers of at least up to 10 milliwatts. Uh, that also brings the advantage when using 1.5 micron that we have the whole uh, catalog of fiber optic components available to be used. The whole toolbox is there, all of that mature components for high speed transmission as well as reception. Uh, we devise for this system uh, passive diffractive beam steerers. That means that the direction of each individual beam is dependent on its wavelength. So beam steering just happens by varying the wavelength of the tunable sources which are located centrally in the, gate, uh, in the gateway box at the entrance of the building or maybe at the same room. That means that you don't need any passive powering of this PRA, this pencil radiating antenna, which makes it uh, good for uh, maintenance. It's also easily scalable because you just add extra wavelengths and you get automatically extra beams. Um, and furthermore, for the network management control people, the wavelength decides where the beam goes to. At the same time, it also carries the data, so it has actually a double function. That means we can talk about a so-called embedded control channel, which eases network management and control. So that's the concept. Within that concept, you may say, what uh, does it bring with respect to other technologies like Wi-Fi and Li-Fi? Well, the basic effect is that with this concept, we don't share capacity. Each user gets its own beam. And because you don't share capacity, you don't hit these capacity borders, which you will get if you plot devices per cell versus bitrate per device. These are limited when you have sharing technologies, as you can see from these various diagonals. When you use individual beams, the capacity per single beam is what the user gets. And by introducing multiple beams, you can increase capacity to quite high numbers. Uh, we reached in the past 112 gigabit per second per beam, realizing 80 beams, so that offers more your close to a terabit per second. Um, the beam acts as a virtual fiber, as already mentioned, so with all the other advantages. Well, um, a key in this system, and one of the keys is the receiver, the optical wireless communication receiver, which has a lot of requirements. Needs, obviously, to have a large bandwidth. It also should have a large aperture to catch as much as possible of this beam. It should have a wide field of view, obviously, to avoid careful alignment at the user side. It should be simple, obviously. It should be compact. It should low power consumption because it typically is at the receiver side where the user has a battery operated equipment. So that are the restrictions for the design. 
several solutions have been reported in the past. This morning I've seen from Harold Haas several of those, compound parabolic concentrators to catch light. Um, they tend to be a bit, uh, um, well, large, so if you would like to have miniature receivers, that's maybe not the preferred way. Angular diversity receiver is another one, where you have multiple photodiodes followed by individual amplifiers. So that brings you a, a quite a lot of electronics in, in your user site with all the issues there. Another option could be to collect the light with surface grating couplers and then combine the light from these couplers with a power combiner into a single waveguide and that single waveguide goes to a single photodiode. That's a concept we also introduced at OFC 2017. Um, wavelength conversion is done by the group of uh, uh, Dominic O'Brien in Oxford University. Um, there's another option to get wide field of view. The concept I would like to propose in this paper is to use a di diode matrix which uh, consists of a two-dimensional structure, which I will show in the next slide. That one only uses a single TIA. And, um, well, with the ECOG 2020, where we introduced this first, what was with uh, four quad photodiodes, we have now transformed it, actually reported this last year at ECOG, into the structure as you see it over here. So the structure basically is a series connection of photodiodes in the matrix, as you can see in each column. Each column is a series connection of photodiodes, and as you know from basic electronics, when you put capacitors in series, then the resulting capacitance is the number of capacitors divided, or the capacitance itself divided by the number of capacitors. If you now put an equal number uh, of these columns in parallel, then you increase the capacitance again. And if you make a square matrix, n in series and n in parallel, then you end up with the junction capacitance result at the same capacitance as you had for a single photodiode. Well, we know that the capacitance of a photodiode is a quite important factor in the bandwidth of your optical preamplifier. The bandwidth typically is given by the inverse, related to the inverse of this capacitance. Um, and if you now analyze that capacitance of this matrix, then you can see that if you have the model for a single photodiode, with the junction capacitance as a major factor, the signal current source, the dark current source, some series connections for the wiring, and some leakage resistor across the junction, this is a single photodiode, and by just uh, using your basic electronic transformations from Tivenet and Norton, you can de derive that the composed model of the matrix um, comes down to the same. But now you can see that the resulting capacitor is the capacitor of the single photodiode times K divided by M, where K and M are the number of photodiodes in parallel and the number of photodiodes in series, M. As the two numbers are equal, then the end result is that it is the same capacitance. Right? Okay, that's a major factor for determining the bandwidth. So from this analysis, you can understand that the capacitance, the bandwidth of such a structure can be equivalent to a single photodiode. Photodiode current is uh, K times, so the number of photodiodes in series uh, as large as a single photodiode. Well, this would be then the frequency characteristics which result from such an architecture. You see several graphs over here. This one, the upper one, is when you would have put all photodiodes just in, in parallel. Obviously, you then get M times K uh, photocurrent. Um, when you do it in the way we propose right now, then you go down with a factor of K, but your bandwidth is again the same as we had for a single photodiode. Whereas with the total parallel connection, you would decrease your bandwidth with a factor M times K. Right. So here you can see in a nutshell what it brings. The conclusion would be that you get the same bandwidth as a single photodiode, whereas you have increased your active area with a factor M square and the output signal is M times larger, which is also represented in the formula over here. And you can see the more extensive formulas in the paper. Well, you may wonder putting photodiodes in series is something which you normally shouldn't do because an ideal photodiode is a current source and your basic electronics tells you that you shouldn't put current sources in series, right? But if you also take into account a parallel resistor into the story and then you do your transform analysis, then you get the results that are just presented to you. Another concern you still may have is when you do this, that then the bias voltage which you apply over this chain of photodiodes is not equally divided among the photodiodes. And the photodiode capacitance is also related to its bias voltage, right? So what does that bring? Well, that's uh, represented in the analysis over here. 
next to the normal leakage which you already have across the junction, we deliberately put another resistor in parallel to the photodiode to divert some of the current, which means that actually the balancing of the bias voltage becomes much better. You see it over here, varying this division of light among the photodiodes. If you would have a large resistor in the parallel, which would be the normal situation, then you can see when you shift uh, the optical power across the photodiodes that the voltage across each photodiode represented by the different colors is heavily impacted. Whereas if you now go to a considerably smaller resistor, this variance would be much less. Right? So that's the solution to equalize the voltage across the photodiodes. And if you look at it in some more detail, uh, this is an analysis done with the photodiode matrix shifting across a Gaussian beam. Uh, if the, the photodiode is out of the center, you can imagine that the distribution of power across the photodiodes is uh, not the same everywhere, right? Um, and here you can see if you would have one mega ohm in parallel to the, the photodiodes, that you get pretty large uh, deviations in the bias voltage, whereas with the 50 kilo ohms only, much less, right? So that's something which you need to take into account. Okay, well, what does this bring for improving your field of view? Well, this picture, Harold showed it already as a sneak preview. But the idea over here is that your optical beam comes in, you have a lens over there, the lens is focusing the light in its focal plane, um, but we deliberately put the photodiode not in the focal plane, but we put it before. So we defocus the photodiode, and by doing the defocusing, the spot at that point will be larger than the photodiode itself, and it means you have margin, margin to move the beam without losing power, right? And that margin which you create translates into a larger field of view. Of course, there's also a disadvantage to that, namely, your coupling factor will decrease, right? So the formula for the, let's say, the back of the envelope assumptions are shown over here. It is the focusing factor, an ideal lens, a uniform beam, which are theoretical assumptions, you will see that your coupling factor goes down, whereas your field of view go out, goes up. So you need to strike a compromise what you would prefer. Well, doing it some more detail, now in the more realistic case, we have a Gaussian beam, we assume not an ideal lens but a Fresnel lens. Fresnel lens is known to have a large aperture uh, together with a small focal length, so it already itself has a large uh, numerical aperture. Here you see the analysis, which has been done. Actually, you see two sets of graphs. The red one are for the 4 by 4 photodiode matrix, whereas the solid curve is the result from the ray tracing, and the dashed curve is the result from the theoretical case, the uniform and ideal lens case. So you see the coupling loss from the beam to the photodiode versus the field of view. Well, you can see if you decrease the coupling loss, so get closer to the focal plane, then your field of view is going down, right? That's for the matrix. For the single photodiode, you see that the field of view is considerably smaller for the same coupling factor, right? So from that, you may conclude that the field of view with such a 4x4 photodiode matrix is substantially larger than you will get with a single photodiode, whereas the bandwidth is still the same, right? And that's what we like to have. Well, this is the practical implementation, and thanks to Kitama, who did lots of this work. Uh, the matrix itself, 4x4 matrix. Actually, we build it out of individual 1x4 photodiode arrays from Albi's Optoelectronics. These uh, were wire bonded. That's not optimum, of course, for high speed, but that's, for practical reasons, the first step to make. So the 4x4 matrix. Then we put this in a PCB circuit, and uh, f substantially you can see here the Fresnel lens on top of that, which together with the rest of the electronics forms our high-speed receiver. Uh, the frequency characteristics, you can see over here, which we measured, are largely dominated by the individual TIA, which is on the PCB. It's commercial TIA, which has a 700 megahertz bandwidth, and to get a whole structure, the, re the net result was 670 megahertz which should be sufficient for gigabit Ethernet. And that has been verified, so you can here see input power versus your bit error rate curves uh, at one gigabit and gigabit Ethernet speed. So you can see that these curves behave relatively nicely. And here you can see how the receiver unit 
can be moved across the user plane uh, to investigate what the actual field of view is, which we can get with this. So experimentally, we verified that for gigabit Ethernet speed, of a gigabit speed, we achieve at least 10 degrees with the structure we have right now, which is clearly not optimized. Right? This is the laboratory setup, as it is available in our Flux building at TUE. So what you do see here, the big picture, is on the top, you see the two PRAs, two LAN systems which launch the beams down to the user site. We use two of them because blockage of one will allow the other one to connect to the user. To the left side, you see all the uh, tunable transmitter stuff and the control laptop for the wavelength tuning. This is the head end of the system, so to speak, and this is the user area, where there are actually two optical receivers mounted over here, which catch the light coming from the PRAs, and they show you here on the screens uh, two individual high-speed video transmission, gigabit Ethernet video. Um, okay, and to the left you see a bit closer how the whole thing with the media convert is connected into a laptop. So that's gigabit Ethernet connectivity to a laptop. And this one, if it works, should show you a video with some sound. So you see receiver module, this is the media converter, the laptop obviously. So you see a direct connection to the laptop itself. Um, here, this transmitted video to the left and the received at the right. And now Ketama is putting a hand in between to show that it is real. So the optical beam is stopped and you see freezing of the video. Takes the hand away and after some time, because the video buffering, the video catches up again and there you go. Right? So this shows that it uh, is working. Okay, well, uh, that brings me to my final slide, hoping to have shown you that an optical wireless communication receiver can be built with this concept, uh, meeting the requirements of high aperture, wide field of view, large bandwidth, and low power consumption, because we need only one TIA, right, at the receiver site. Uh, the novel concept of the scalable two-dimensional photodiode array, we build it with two by two, but theoretically you can expand it to any size which you want, right? At some point parasitics will jump in, but um, well, there's also been already, people in Japan have shown 10 by 10 and so for this concept. And we showed also that this is uh, applicable for live video gigabit ethernet streaming, where the system itself acts as a kind of receiver dongle. Finally, some acknowledgement to the funding sources, European Research Council and uh, Albis Optoelectronics for providing us with the photodite matrix according to our design. Okay, thank you.